So again, um, welcome everybody. I am Arne Finalstefjord and I am the Chief Learning Officer at the Consortium for Service Innovation. And I lead the training and certification arm of the consortium. And, and the consortium is a, a nonprofit alliance of member companies developing innovative ways to improve engagement in a variety of areas. And that includes um, customer service, HR support, IT support, sales and customer success, to name a few. And it's always great when we're hearing new applications of our work. And then we are funded um, predominantly by our member companies. So we'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. Included here are the benefactor and sponsor level members. And then we organize our work in these five buckets. Most have heard about KCS, but we have many other um, work in intelligence warming, predictive customer engagement, leadership, customer engagement initiative, et cetera. And um, what we find is that uh, these are blending more and more. And I think the measuring success by channel work is a great example of how they're blending because this certainly touches on, on many of these pieces. And then we have a variety of ways for members to engage from broad to focused events. And we open up some of these events to the public as we're doing with this one. So I'm um, really glad to have everybody here. And speaking of events, want to make sure that you are aware of all the upcoming public events. So on October 19th, we'll be hosting the very popular KCS roundtables where we give you an opportunity to ask questions to expert practitioners on a variety of topics, um, including getting started on your KCS journey, establishing and sustaining a KCS coach program, measuring the value of uh, your digital transformation, and name a few. And then on uh, November 9th, David Kay from DBK and Associates will be presenting on generative AI for KCS and uh, some proven use cases there. And so in this session, uh, David will show over a dozen ways that Gen AI can make um, KCS quicker and easier. And some of them are going to be very surprising for you. So I encourage you to attend that. And then on uh, December 12th, join us for the 2023 year in review. Again, this is open to the public. So join the consortium staff um, as they provide an overview, all the, the work that the members uh, did in 2023. And then we're really excited about our upcoming annual member summit. So that's um, April 9th to the 11th. And uh, again, this is open to both members and non-members. And we're going to explore the intersection of empathy and AI-assisted knowledge sharing, as well as many other topics. So I'm really excited about that. And then... Oh, and my, here we go. So I'm really excited about um, today's event and um, happy to introduce Amy Dotson and Christina Rusin. And Amy is the Director of Digital Support at Smarsh and she is a 20 year plus consortium contributor and one of our consortium innovators. And she's contributed to many of our practices as well as shared her best practices and, and lessons learned uh, in many of her KCS deployments. And her company also just won the ASP Top Support Site Award. So congrats on that. And then Christina is a senior community program manager at Akamai. And not only does she know self-service um, really well, but she has a very strong background in business intelligence and data analysis for global customer care organizations. And she is also a consortium innovator for her work on understanding and maximizing success by channel, this work, as well as contributions in many uh, other areas. And I had the pleasure of working with Amy and Christina and many others um, in this multi-year working group on understanding and maximizing success by channel. And today we're going to be focusing on the self-service channel uh, and share the key measures for that channel. Um, but some housekeeping before we begin, please put yourself on mute during this event and please um, post your questions in chat. So Christina, Amy, and I will be monitoring the chat and we'll either answer them in the chat, bring them up as appropriate to the speaker in the flow or save them for the Q&A session uh, at the end. 
And we're going to send out the chat log with the recording and the presentation uh, to all who have registered, as well as a blog highlighting this event. And I'm very excited about today's event. So let's get started on measuring self-service success. So first, I'd like to thank the member companies that participate in defining these measures. So we had many companies from different industries, including tech, healthcare, entertainment, and service. And we had many participants from these companies, and, and many of them are on the call. So we want to thank them for their contribution. Really appreciate that. And when we um, look at self-service measurements, we need to start with the customer. And so what are they trying to do? And we purposely up-level the customer issue beyond the typical issues coming into a case in the break, fix, and how-tos to a much broader definition of anything that inhibits or prevents the user from getting their work done with your product or service. And many of you have seen the customer demand model from our training courses and, and other presentations. And based on some industry data, if X is the number of cases, some companies are seeing 10X demand in self-service and 30X demand in communities and social. And as a result, the assisted channel, as you can see here, is handling just a small fraction of the customer issues. And I think people get the general concept, but at the same time, we always get questions on how did these companies come up with 10X and 30X for the self-service and, and community measures? And that's gonna be the, the focus of uh, this talk, particularly on the self-service. So what we did is we developed a framework on what we wanted to measure. So we started with the agent assist case metrics to ensure our alignment and maximize acceptance. We didn't wanna replace the traditional service metrics. Um, rather, we wanted to expand uh, them to better align to that customer demand that we just showed. And this also allows us to easily show comparative traffic and weighted averages. You'll see those, those total sections, um, you know, that's uh, totals as well as weighted averages as you get down there. And uh, this, um, is extremely helpful and what we're going to share, you know, why this is so, so critical up leveling it to the customer issue and expanding away from the cases, just the currency. And we didn't want just one method for each metric. Rather, we wanted to provide a choice of good, better, and best measures um, to serve a wider audience. So I am now excited to pass it over to Amy to uh, go over this first section of the spreadsheet. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk about the traffic and success portion of the worksheet and how you um, get the numbers to plug into the worksheet to figure out your success rate. So um, first thing we're gonna talk about is the number of att attempted engagements. So the good, better, best options, good would be the number of sessions per month. So if you could pull that, you're all set, you can plug the number in. Better is the number of sessions per month that includes at least one content view. And the best is the same as better, but includes failed attempts. So if somebody does a search and doesn't get any content back, you want to include, in that, include that. Um, when I originally did this, when I was at Sage, we were able to get the good number. So it's a number of views per month. And when we did that, we came out with a 68-32 split, saying 68% of our engagements were through self-service. We knew that didn't sound right. So we had to go back and figure out how to get that better metric. Um, and once we did, it came to a 55%, 45% split, meaning 55% of our engagements were through self-service, 45 was through agent assist, and that felt uh, right to us. So um, you really do need to go as deep as you can and good, better, best, it works. The deeper you can go, uh, the more accurate your numbers will be. Next slide. When looking at uh, the percent channel of success, so good would be if you can get the percent of sessions or visits without request for assistance. So somebody came out to your site, they didn't initiate a chat, they didn't create a case. If you cannot get this number, um, some members take the number of sessions with at least one content view and just assume a 20% success rate. So you could do that. Better is um, using a survey, asking the customer, were you successful? Um, and then taking that and applying a confidence interval, which we're gonna show you how to do that in just a second. 
And then best is survey plus a sophisticated clickstream analysis. Um, we actually used a survey and I'll show you this on the uh, next slide, Arnfin. So at Sage, we used a Qualtrics survey and the survey popped in anytime a customer visited the site, unless they filled out the survey. And if they filled out the survey, we wouldn't pop it again for 30 days. And we just simply asked them, were they successful? Yes or no. We went through many iterations. It seems very simple, but <laughs> we went through many iterations asking them too much information, not enough information. And this is where we landed. So if you wanna to flip to the next slide here, this is a, um, a resource that's available to everybody free. Um, this will help us help you determine the confidence interval, meaning did you get enough surveys back in order to be confident in your success rate? So we're gonna go through how to fill out that survey in just a second. I think we're gonna uh, drop this link in the chat for you. Next slide, please. Okay, so determining your sample size. Um, you can choose for the confidence level, you can choose either 95 or 99%. 95% uh, is the standard. The confidence interval is the margin of error. And then the population is the number you got through the good, better, and best. So um, in my example, I got the better metric. So content views, uh, sorry, sessions with at least one content view. So I pop that number in and I hit calculate. And what it's telling me is I need at least 2,397 surveys completed to have a 95% confidence level of a plus or minus 2%. So if you flip to the next slide here, um, I was able to get, uh, when I looked at my surveys, um, I had 2,939 surveys back, so I met the threshold. And one thing to remember is when you're pulling your session data, if you're pulling session data from you know, January to June, you wanna make sure you're only pulling survey data from January to June. So um, my sample size, again, my confidence level is 95%. My sample size, the number of surveys I actually got back was 2,939. And then that population, again, that's the number of sessions I had with at least one content view. And then my percentage here was um, the 31%. That's how many people actually said they were successful when they came to my site. So once I hit calculate, I have a confidence interval of 1.67. So that means I'm 95% confident that my success rate of 31% plus or minus 1.67%. So I'm gonna hand it off to Christina and she's going to talk about the average length and cost per session. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everybody. Um, you're gonna have to excuse my voice a little bit. Um, I'm a little bit sick. So, um, as Arnfin said in his kind introduction, I'm the program manager for the Akamai customer community. I'm very excited to be a member of this working group. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two additional inputs to the spreadsheet, the average length of a successful self-service interaction and how to calculate the average cost per self-service success. But I wanna talk about average length first. Um, it's important to note before I talk about good, better, best, so what we're talking about here is really time to solution offered or solution provided to a customer. The case equivalent would be like time to mitigate or time to resolve, not time to close. Time to close on a case, right? It includes a bunch of follow-up activity and getting agreement from your customer to close the case. What I'm talking about here really is just time to present the solution. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so let's talk about good, better, best. Here are some of the ways we can try and look at estimating the average length of a self-service success. So good, kind of your starting point, um, you could use an assumed number that leverages the experience of other similar organizations. Um, a lot of member companies have found this generally falls in the five minute range. Um, but of course, your own individual environment is going to be specific to you. So another way you might approach good is to ask users from within your organization who have similar experience and expertise as a customer, you know, maybe in your customer success organization or in your support organization, to do some test runs on your, in your environment. Um, ask them to try and find a solution and time themselves, and then use an average of those tests as your measure. Um, if you have web analytics like Google Analytics, you can use that data for a better approach 
Um, for example, you may use um, average time on, an, on a knowledge article page multiplied by the number of knowledge pages viewed per session, and then maybe even add in a little time for um, landing page and search page activity. If you've got more powerful analytics in your tool belt, um, there's a lot of tools. A lot of them are aimed at marketing environments, but you can turn them on your self-service journey. Um, and you can put them to use identifying like what represents a self-service success journey, what path through your site, and then get some durations of those uh, types of web sessions. I'm gonna talk about how I approached getting an average time to success for our organization. So next slide, please. So the first thing I do, um, and people who know me have heard this speech before, um, before thinking about any kind of measurement is to step back and think about my data in the big picture. Where's my data coming from? And what context do I need to consider for my data? Our customer community is on the Salesforce Experience Cloud Platform, which provides most of our reporting, but to get web activity analytics, I am using Google Analytics, and I'm using Google Analytics 4 now. What do I know about my self-service environment is all about my business context, and it's critical anytime you're thinking about any kind of metric, not just self-service, to be sure and stop and ask yourself, what should I keep in mind about my business processes, my customers, my infrastructure, or any other factor that can impact what you're measuring? You don't have to be an expert in all of your business processes, but you should know enough to understand and apply that context to your data. So for us, we have two sites that offer knowledge content. The community gets the majority of the traffic for knowledge and the other site only gets about 2% of our volume. Um, the statistics for my secondary site when it comes to average length of engagement are very similar. So for ease of calculation, I'm just gonna use community data. Um, our community has some knowledge publicly available and some only available behind a login. External search engines like Google account for nearly half the traffic to our community. For that reason, we recently started partially exposing more articles to public view, making the content discoverable by organic search, but asking users to log in to see the entire article. And one important thing to note is it's very common practice for our users to share direct links to articles as they work with a customer through a case or afterwards. So all of this context is gonna be important to me uh, to keep in mind as I start to look at actual data. Next slide, please. So like some of you may know, um, Google Analytics recently forced us over into Google Analytics 4, something I'd been putting off looking at until I was forced to. Um, the data model completely changed with this new release, and I'm still doing a little bit of work to catch up. But new with Google Analytics 4 is the concept of user, user engagement. Um, and I found that it's really useful. The concept of an engaged session is new. So an engaged session lasts longer than 10 seconds, this is adjustable by the way, has at least two page views or contains a conversion event if you have that configured. So while they do still measure bounce, engagement is a different and I think a little improved way to think about bounce, percent of engaged sessions on, on your site. And more importantly to this discussion, engagement time is counted as time when the site was in focus in the user's browser. So this does not include the time someone had the page open in a tab in the background while they work on something else, which solves one of the problems we used to discuss all the time. How can I tell how long someone was actually looking at the page? So engagement time is more accurate than time on page when it comes to user experience. And it's what I'm gonna start using, which is kind of exciting. However, um, the duration is generally gonna be shorter because of the new way it's calculated. So I'm probably gonna have some change management to do with my user base when they see this drop all of a sudden. So the snippet um, you see here on screen is from a user acquisition report and I filtered it for pages on my site that are knowledge articles. And it shows an overall average engagement time of nearly three minutes. But when I'm looking at the breakdown by traffic source, I can see that I have a lot of direct traffic and it's really impacting my overall number. So if I think back to what I know about my environment, I know it's really common for people to send direct links to articles. That's what I see reflected here. Next slide, please. So because what I'm trying to measure 
is the length of a self-service journey. I've chosen to remove direct traffic from the calculation. If someone's been sent a link in email or in chat, this almost always means they're already working with someone at our company and the customer isn't really engaged in self-service, right? So when I did that, I end up in that five minute range. Um, I thought I was gonna be a unique snowflake, but no, here I am in the five minute range of engagement. As expected, this is actually a little shorter than the length we used to get before we switched to engagement time um, versus time on page. And so now I'm left with traffic from organic search and referral traffic from other sites, which really more accurately represents the self-service journey I'm trying to measure and improve. So what I really want to say about this is um, it's not about how you specifically, because you may not be using Google Analytics for your self-service journey may look different. The important thing is to think, to understand the metric that you're looking at, what, what's behind it, and to make sure you're considering the business context that you have when you're thinking about measuring that self-service journey. This is the journey I'm trying to improve. Organic search and referral makes up that traffic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide, please. Speaking of improving, uh, time to solution, the Measuring Success by Channel Working Group um, after discussing and uh, you know dissecting all of these ways to measure things, the conversation kind of naturally drifted into, well, how do we improve it? How do we maximize what we're measuring? Um, so we've been having a lot of really interesting conversations about improving self-service success across a number of different channels. This is a very simple diagram of a web journey. When thinking about your user's path, try to think about where you can insert opportunities for them to find their own answers how you can influence them and maximize the chance that they'll take that opportunity to self-serve, and then how can you measure how successful each of those influence points are? So for example here, um, one big opportunity is when a user Googles for an answer. You know, do you have your content as available and discoverable as possible? Is it structured to promote um, you know, being high in the search results list? As you work to improve this, you can look at you know, your organic traffic volume, click through rate reporting to determine how successful you're being. So this is just a very simplified and very high level snippet of the types of conversations we're having in this group working group. And if it uh, interests you and you're a member, I'd encourage you to reach out to Arnfin to join the working group. Next slide, please. So average cost per success is a lot more straightforward, um, or at least it's shorter to talk about. Now that we know how many self-service successes we have, you take the total cost of your self-service program and divide it by the number of successes. Sounds pretty easy, right? But the key here again is context and using it to determine your best measurement of cost for self-service. If you're already calculating a cost per case or a cost per ticket, that measures the cost of an agent-assisted interaction, the best practice is to use those same factors when calculating self-service cost. So this could be staffing, right? Either, you know, straight salary or fully burdened labor costs. It could include infrastructure or platform costs, software licensing, those kinds of things. Whatever you're using, try to make the factors the same for both figures, cost per case and cost per self-service. And if you aren't calculating this now, your finance team probably has some good ideas about what to include in cost. They always like to join that conversation. But importantly, this does not include the cost of your KCS program. Even though it's the engine that's generating self-service content, you are doing this work and reaping the benefits whether you expose knowledge articles externally or not. So really, you should only be including the incremental costs associated with your self-service environment, maintaining it, running it, you know, offering this content to your customers. And last slide, please. Um, I'm going to leave you with whatever methods you determine are best for you to use to fill in the self-service spreadsheet. I want to leave you with what I call my 3D approach to metrics. The first D is digestibility. You want your measures to be easily understood by people at all levels within your audience. And it's important to achieve a balance between precision and digestibility. What do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. Let's say I decide one day all on my own 
then I need to incorporate standard deviation into my average self-service duration. I'm going to eliminate some of the highest and lowest engagement times from my calculation. And as a result, my metric goes from 5 minutes and 21 seconds to 5 minutes and 2 seconds. Is that a significant impact or is my first very easily communicated calculation enough? I have spent a lot of time, as Arnfin mentioned, with data, especially support data, over the course of my career. And um, I have an inherent bias towards precision. And the hardest lesson I've had to learn is that it's hard for people to really incorporate a measurement into their thinking and decision making unless they can understand how you got that number, no matter how elegant your math is or how amazingly precise the calculation result is, they need to be able to understand how you got there. Durability is about designing, designing your measures, pardon me, to withstand change. Self-service success data is most useful when it's tracked over time, so you can see the impact of changes you make to your environment. If you find yourself having to adjust or reset something in your data, um, in your metrics or your dashboard, every time the business makes a small or even medium change to process, you need to rethink your approach. Try to come up with a way to make things more adaptable and durable as things change, because there's nothing certain except that things are going to change. And lastly is defensibility, which is kind of what I've been talking about this whole time. Um, be sure that you understand all the parts of your data and your data context, that you can provide supporting measures and good logic to anyone who does want to dive in deeper with you into these numbers. It's become increasingly important to highlight the value delivered by self-service, which is why we're all here. And having these kinds of metrics, you're thinking about 3D when it comes to your metrics, makes it easier to communicate that value out to your organization. And Arnfin's going to talk more about value next, so I'm going to hand it back over to him. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so you just wanted to underscore um, how you need to shift away from the traditional support metrics to more of the customer issue-based metrics. So if you look at uh, the traditional case focus, which we include in our spreadsheet, the, the time for resolution, um, the average cost per case, um, we don't have it in the spreadsheet, but what many of them do is cases per engineer also. These are probably very familiar metrics to many of you. So what, what happens when we drive these known issues to self-service? So unfortunately, they all go in the wrong direction. So your average time to resolution, um, that's going up because now you're handling more new cases. You've shifted your easy known issues to self-service. So that's going in the wrong direction. Your average cost per case is going up. So that's going in the wrong direction because again, uh, as many of you know, a new issue takes longer to resolve because it's new to you. Um, so that's um, not looking good. And then uh, cases per engineer, because now you're having fewer cases, um, that's not looking very good either. And then unfortunately, um, that drives the, the wrong behavior uh, with leadership because there's, oh, we have fewer cases, therefore we need fewer people, even though these people are supporting your self-service and other channels. So again, who looks bad? Um, with these metrics. So you have many groups in your in your company. Um, some are embracing KCS and, and shifting their known problems to self-service. Some are not. Unfortunately, if you have this uh, case focus as the, the currency, the people who are doing the right thing, shifting, practicing KCS, shifting those known issues to self-service are the ones who look bad. Because again, they're getting all their known issues out or the vast majority of them out. And these are all going in the wrong direction. So this is why this self-service measurement initiative is so critical. Um, again, we often see that when senior leadership focuses on the case as a currency, their biggest cost um, in the cost per case is headcount. And so their focus is more on offshoring or other cost reductions and really not the right focus. So instead, if we shift the currency to the customer issues served across all the channels, rather than just the case, now they're all going in the right direction. So you can see that average time resolution goes down, as you saw from the spreadsheet, as you have more, the average time resolution, as Christina showed, 
is approximately five minutes compared to much, much longer when you're handling the case. So as you're shifting those known issues, that's going down dramatically. Your average cost per issue, the, the cost per issue is just a small fraction um, in self-service than in the case. So that goes down. Um, and then your issues per engineer is going up. And some might say, well, why do you include the issues per engineer? Because they're they're handling the cases. And as we know with KCS, they are managing that that knowledge and they're contributing, they're improving it and such. So giving them um, an opportunity to look at all of the issues that they're solving is a great change management rather than just, again, the, the cases. And, and that's why we've uh, you, you haven't heard case avoidance at all in this conversation because we fail and many, unfortunately, use that as the way to measure self-service. And we find that if you can shift the currency to the customer issue, and just as we've shown here, look at the um, the number of issues being solved by those channels, the success, the time to resolution, the cost, et cetera, then again, these all go in the right direction. And uh, now with this measurement, you are positively recognizing the teams that are practicing KCS and maximizing that shift of known issues to, to self-service. And now fortunately your senior leadership metrics are aligned with your digital transformation. So now the focus is on shifting problems to self-service and other channels. So that's um, where we've actually, it's been nice to see that many are embracing this because now with this new metric, as we all know, KCS is a key enabler for this. So now your KCS program is a critical initiative for your service organization. And it's great to see more and more companies shifting the currency from the case to the customer issue we've had, and they're getting great success with it. We had a... Um, a recent uh, presentation from NetApp where they're one of their big metrics is cost per issue. And they're showing how it's going down dramatically as they're shifting um, shifting those issues left, shifting up that digital transformation. And all the way up to their president is very engaged in that metric. It's really resonating. So to what Christina was mentioning, you, you have to make sure that these are, are resonating. So let's look at, let me get over to, we had the third quadrant. Um, and this one is still in the forming stage, but a very important quadrant. Um, for customer satisfaction, most are included on surveys. So certainly in your post case transactional survey, you um, certainly are asking for their satisfaction there. So you're getting that. Um, in addition to what Amy showed as far as success, um, many are also including the satisfaction. Um, so were, not only were you successful, but how satisfied were you with that journey? And then uh, for customer level of effort, uh, similar thing, surveys are being used. Um, we're seeing more and more because you not only want them to be successful, but with the least amount of effort whether regardless of the channel, whether it be case, community, self-service, et cetera. So getting these data point is very, very important. And we're seeing more and more companies starting to embrace this. So they got the success by channel now. Now they're trying to maximize the success while minimizing the, the customer effort. And we're seeing that surveys, again, um, are probably the most predominant so we'll see, for example, uh, Intel has in there, um, they shared that with their surveys, they're not only asking were they successful, but what was the level of effort on a five-point scale? And uh, they're getting some great insight there. They're using that same scale for their, their cases. And again, that's one of their key KPIs is, is driving that uh, effort lower. And uh, we're seeing many companies starting to embrace that, but that's still on the forming stage. And then some are using clickstream analysis. So they'll look at um, the um, average click rank, searches with no results, uh, percent content available on Google, a variety of things to um, try to get a gauge for that customer level of effort. And then customer loyalty, um, Sage shared some great analysis in their working team in the reduction in churn when customers engage in multiple service channels, as opposed to just logging cases. So that was 
very, very powerful. And particularly with the community channel, because uh, what we're finding is that those customers of your customers who engage in community tend to be much more sticky because that's their tribe, if you will. There's their people that um, they've uh, been engaged with, uh, but certainly self-service has a big impact too on that churn. And then others uh, are including the NPS question uh, net promoter score in their self-service um, surveys. So they're trying to, to get this, but it's it's hard when you're looking at loyalty, uh, doing it by channel, because it's really looking at um, uh, many channels. So looking at that more holistically, but certainly we're seeing the customer satisfaction and customer level of effort by channel is working very well. So what we'd like to do is um, actually show you some of the resources available to you. So we do have, we published um, this work, the Understanding Success by Channel uh, project. Again, as uh, Christina and Amy alluded to, this is a an ongoing, we meet uh, on a regular basis. And uh, our first focus was on understanding the success. And now we're moving towards uh, maximizing the success by channel. And um, so here we have documented our first phase, the self-service. So you'll see this familiar spreadsheet. Future phases, um, we did next move to the community channel as a measurement. We finished that up and we'll be working on getting that available to the more public consumption later this year. And then, and we hope to have another um, public webinar similar to this where we'll go through all the communities. So we'll, we'll introduce you to that. But you can see for the self-service, there's some background and context. There is the executive overview um, assumptions and limitations, always critical. Uh, and then some of the prereq um, information that you'll need that um, Christina touched on a bit. And then we do have, we we'll won't go through this whole, but we'll put the link in the chat. But that spreadsheet that we utilized, you can just um, copy or download this right here. And then we give, again, this summary of for each one of these, the, the yellow, is your input fields, and then the blues are the calculations. So we give you the um, good, better, and best on how to do all these things. And again, the blue over here in the totals, this is gonna give you either your totals or your weighted averages. And um, so we bring, take you through all of these. Um, so you'll see for all of the ones that we just discussed today, you'll have it uh, documented here. And then um, for members, what we did is um, we took some examples and suggestions. So on the number of engagements, the the presentation and um, and recording, same thing for le length of successful engagements, um, the cost, um, how you do the customer satisfaction as well as the survey. So a variety of ones here. So encourage you to take a look at that. And you need to be logged in for this. So make sure that when you're viewing this, if you're a member, you're logged in and you get to see this, this additional information. So really excited. And again, this has worked out very well. We're seeing more and more companies utilizing these metrics and um, it's resonating very well. So hopefully with these resources, um, you'll be taking advantage of this and doing the change management with your organization. But now we'd love to open it up to questions. So let's, um, and with me doing this slide generation, um, I, as far as the slide churning, didn't get all the chat, but um, Christina or Amy, do you want to bring up things that um, we did not cover that we want to? We have let's quite a few. Yeah, we do have some questions in the in the chat. Um, let me take a look. Sorry, it keeps scrolling down as everyone keeps chatting. <laughs> um, I have, um, and I actually see one from Lynette. Um, she was uh, clarifying. So issues per engineer includes count of um, the KCS content that has helped people in self-service and, and absolutely. So um, great clarification. And so this is what we find with engineers. Um, they're certainly creating and uh, improving content um, for your self-service, 
They're also um, in many organizations helping in the community. So if an issue is not, uh, question is not solved by the, the larger community within like 24 hours, then often the support organization is getting engaged. So um, where your support organization is getting engaged, um, definitely count those issues resolved in that channel. Um, so great, great clarifying question, Lynette. But others, I'm sorry, Christina, as you were going through? Yeah, um, Carol Lee asked, would issue focused time to resolution include self-service and agent assisted, um, thereby lowering time to resolution in a mature environment? So I think it depends on what level you're looking at the metrics. If you wanted to switch kind of as an entire support organization to thinking about issue focused time to resolution, yeah, you could combine those two. Um, and say overall, whether you self-serve or you um, go to one of our agents, this is kind of overall the time to, to solve an issue. Um, the reason we end up splitting it up so much between self-service and agent assisted really has to do with when you're trying to target focused improvements, the things you're doing are very, very different, right? To improve your self-service journey versus to help an agent um, solve a, an issue faster. But yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I found it might be a little high level for leadership to really kind of grasp that overall, this is how long it takes. Um, I find that presenting both types of um, both types of resolution makes more sense. If you, sh I'm trying to think about how to word this. The way we talk about it is to try, instead of talking about like deflection or case avoidance is we look at here's the overall demand for support. And there are many ways we can satisfy that demand. They could talk to an agent, they could self-serve, they could, you know, um, be helped by a bot. However, um, you know, we want to try and shift some traffic out of assisted and into self-service. We're never going to shift it all. There's always going to be a need for assisted, but we look at it as kind of one big piece of one big demand for our services that gets satisfied in different ways. I don't know if that even answered the question. Yeah, that was great. And and in that spreadsheet that you can download, it does automatically calculate the weighted average. So as you are shifting issues to these um, lower time to resolution channels, like self-service communities, et cetera, as you shift that, it uh, automatically calculates the weighted average. So it's been really nice with leadership because again, it's hard for them to get away from the case as the currency because that's where most of their costs are. But what we find is when they shift it more to that customer issue, then they're looking at more of these weighted averages as their goals. So as I mentioned with uh, NetApp, that cost per issue now is their, uh, their goal. It's no longer cost per case. They're certainly looking at that, as Christina mentioned, because, you know, you're trying to optimize for every channel, but um, it just better aligns to the digital transformation. So you can see, ah, as we're shifting left, as we're moving those um, those issues to our lower, lower cost, lower effort channels, um, we're seeing a dramatic improvement in the business. How about other questions that um so there's a question here does anyone use outbound phone calls for customer satisfaction measurement and i'm not sure i fully understand the question but we use for the assisted we use outbound and inbound phone calls but we separate out our customer sat uh in terms of assisted versus unassisted um do you guys have anything to add to that, Arnfin or Christina? I think what Kelly's asking, um, and Kelly, speak up if if I got this wrong, is um, outbound phone calls to customers to do a voice survey oh. after the fact. Yeah, that is what I was referencing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I have. I have. I mean, I have in my career used those. Um, I haven't for a long time. It seems like everything's trending towards email or even SMS for satisfaction. Or on page, is anybody using actual voice conversations for customer sat? We see that often it's a, a follow-up that you might be using the traditional um, transactional surveys that are going out in the email. But if then someone is not happy on that, then you get a follow-up um, uh, call. Yeah, absolutely. Those things. So we've certainly seen that. 
but I think in order to calculate and uh, to get those uh, a larger <laughs> amount of uh, sample size, we, we see again, it's more automated with the emails and such. <coughs> And then um, I see Melissa Birch asked the question about um, have the conversations in the working group including measurements that include like chatbot self-service <coughs> or um, chat is chatbot success uh, implied in these measures. And it definitely is when you look at um, when they're engaging in self-service, there's so many different paths. So they can engage in a chatbot if you had that um, set up. They might um, navigate rather than search. Um, so really looking at the path. And so we encourage you for your site to look at the click stream and look at the various paths that your customers are taking, but that all is included. So whether they use a chatbot, whether they um, are navigating an article, searching to get to that article, um, whatever, ways that are using, you are then, as Amy shared, you're serving up that survey as, as what we recommend is the better and asking them if they resolve their issue via self-service. And, and again, chatbot is included that. We see sometimes chatbot gets included depending on how customers implement it. Sometimes chatbot is in the case flow. Um, so it really depends on your company where you um, where you put that. But um, more and more, we're seeing chatbot as part of self-service because you don't want uh, them to have to initiate a case flow in order to, to get those uh, those known issues. So hopefully that clarified that, Melissa. But other ones that... Oh, and, and there was one Brian was saying, uh, thinking of that shift from measuring case avoidance to support interactions across the desired channels. So um, as, as you're not alone, that as um, support management is hyper-focused on cost, we found that a compelling argument uh, uh, to management is shift the measurement perspective. I'm sorry, have you found? Um, and we've definitely found that. So that has been... If you can get them focused away from just the case and looking at all of those other channels and aligning their metrics to that, that has helped uh, dramatically. Um, and what we see with some companies, you might have the service organization own the cases, another organization own self-service, another own um, the communities. And we actually found that getting these measurements aligned by channel um, is very helpful for getting them all on kind of a single goaling and such. And then it also, again, the service organization who has just responsibility for the cases, they're one of the key drivers in enabling um, self-service. So as you're looking at that holistically, even if they don't own that, um, they're getting uh, credit for, they have that shared goal on reducing those um, costs per issue, time resolution, et cetera. And one of the things you can do with the, um, the the data that you collect in the in that model spreadsheet is kind of game out what it would look like if in the future you shifted two percent of your tra of your traffic out of assisted and into self service. Like how much cost avoidance can you do by self with self service? We use that a lot for like ROI on self service projects, right? This this project we think will shift one percent of our traffic out of assisted and into self-service. And that means a savings of, or that means we can grow without hiring new people. Great point, Christina. And in my experience, a lot of this comes down to kind of shifting the culture within our leadership and how we speak about self-service, right? In that shift left move, if we can start talking about solutions delivered versus cases closed, then we can really start talking about and connecting the dots across those channels a little more effectively and, and get out of that siloed perspective. But it takes a lot of conversation with leadership to really dive in and, and help change that, that way of thinking. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And Jason was has been and continues to be a great contributor to this working group. So appreciate that. So we have a question here for Warren. It's really for the group. I'm wondering if anyone incorporates customer self-built channels like Reddit into their community data analytics, and if so, how? 
Is anyone doing that? I'm oh. not currently. A lot of people ask though about like Stack Overflow or Reddit. How do you try and capture um, these kind of organic crop up communities? We haven't attempted to do that. Has anybody else? We have, I don't know if AARP is on, but um, when we were, and this is kind of the, the next phase that we'll be uh, getting available and presenting, but in the communities and social, we first looked at the whole communities and, and all of the social. Um, and then we uh, decided to focus just on the company owned community as the first phase, but we do have as a future phase, the uh, social. Um, because there are so many, particularly in more of the B2C and such, you just, there's so many, uh, different ways that customers are result getting, maximizing the, the value of that product. Um, and people are using, uh, products like sprinkler and such listening devices to, of uh, these various social, um, channels to see when they should be getting engaged. But that's, uh, one of our future phases is the social. That's the, the hardest because, uh, to the point it's not company owned. So getting the metrics and such are much harder. But great question. Thanks, Harpin. All right. And feel free to take yourself off mute for the last part. So if there's any additional questions that we missed that you want answered, feel free to take yourself off mute and, and ask those questions. I actually have a question. Um, I'm trying to figure out our, uh, like just our overall engagement. And I'm wondering if there's any specific length of time that anyone's using to count as a new uh, engagement. So in GA4, I've built out audiences and I can say, oh, it resets on a day, it resets on five days, a week, 10 days, a month. Is there anything that anybody's using on average to say, this person came on Tuesday and I'll count them as a new person on Thursday, or I'm just trying to get a feel for what's the right number. So it's a, <laughs> I'm going to go back to context because I always do. We had to, we look at like kind of the velocity of what the average customer, uh, the velocity of their case creation. Mm -hmm. So if you have customers, um, I don't know if you were beta, B to C, let's say, and you had, you know, customers opening multiple cases a day mm -hmm. or a case every day. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the average velocity, maybe at the account level, probably not at the individual user level. Um, and based on that, that's what I would try and, and work with my threshold. So if I have my, my average customer actually doesn't, they don't ca create cases very often. Um, we use a day, mm -hmm. right? It's like, if you come back the same day, I'm assuming you're kind of researching the same issue. Okay. Yeah. I know like on average, our accounts open three cases a month, but so I'm like, oh, it could do 10 days could be the threshold. But then I'm like, you could be solving multiple problems in 10 days. So exactly. yeah, for sure. <laughs> find that sweet it's spot. A, in. <laughs> it's a, and it's going to vary by individual user and by product. Account and every... product. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of variation. So sometimes it just feels like um, I have to just put a, you know, put mm -hmm. a uh, stake in the ground mm -hmm. and then just measure, use that as my baseline mm -hmm. and then measure from there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That helps a lot. And it, it does uh, just as another data point. I know uh, Oracle was looking at like 48 hours. So that was, and it, it varies as Christine said, by, uh, by um, customer, um, by company. The, the other thing that you have to really be careful about is in many organizations, um, they give everyone access to self-service in communities, but only a certain subset of that can actually log cases. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be very careful about that. that uh, that's just, how we are. Yeah. 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 That's our um, model. Yeah. Because um, as, as a, an example, um, some of the data we looked at on the exit surveys, how many had a session without a case create? And um, for Oracle, it was 96%. And mm -hmm. so, wow, 96% successful. But mm -hmm. then followed up with, well, what's your next step? And um, there was, oh, I solved my problem, or I'm going to another site, or I'm going to come back later, or I'm escalating to my internal team. And we found that that was, after you broke out all those others, only 45% or so said they were actually successful. 
others just abandon for a variety of reasons. So you have to make sure that you really, to uh, Christina's point, when she was going through, really understand the audience and uh, kind of break out all those assumptions. Thank you. All right, we have time for another question, a last question, anyone? Um, someone mentioned uh, Google Analytics 4. I know not all of you are using it, but a lot of us have been kind of forced into this new, brave new world. Um, we will add, or I'll add some of the, the kind of reference articles that I used when thinking about Google Analytics 4 in the, um, in the follow-up blog that will be published for this session. And then members, um, in member Slack, maybe we should start a channel for Google mm -hmm. Analytics 4 so we can all collectively scream and yell and solve our problems. Yeah, and just to, to reiterate what we will do um, early next week, we'll send out the recording, the chat log, and we'll clean it up too. We'll try to get as much of that um, aligned to the question and the answer. Um, we'll have a blog with the resources uh, as well as the presentation. And um, so, yeah, we really appreciate. This has been, uh, I think people have really loved engaging in this um, this working group because it's again so valuable and it's a big culture and change management as uh, people were mentioning and so um it definitely makes an impact if you can get this implemented in your company so again thank you so much and uh, look forward to speaking with you on the the next um next event thank you thanks everyone thanks, thank you so, much. thanks. thanks so much thank you thank you